thanks ever for the introduction. I would tell you, listening to it cold, it reminds me I need to write a new introduction because it's way too technical. And I think the better thing to do is to tell you the following. I'm an Oswego graduate. I'm a father of two, a stepfather for another three because I was remarried to that Oswego alumni individual. I ride a Harley. I like to play drums. In my part time, I have a lot of fun with friends and family. I'm a big enabler in terms of bringing people together to bring a, a network of people to enjoy life. Um, and that goes to high school friends, college friends, work friends, and I know a couple of them are in the audience and or watching. Um, and it's more important to understand the individual because later on we'll have a chance to actually get into Q&A. And I would just encourage both you in the audience as well as you on the video screen, ask anything and everything. And I will try to answer as many as I can in terms of personal profession or views of the world that we see. Before I jump into the conversation, I'd like to actually tell a bit of a story with a purpose. A lot of times when I'm walking around campus, people say, help us understand what's it gonna take to be successful in the working world. So let me sort of hit that with one very small example and story. And I think it's becoming more important in today's society as we talk about the concepts of engagement, civility, hospitality, and humanity. How many of us know the name John Major? For some, John Major was actually the ex-prime minister of the UK. For somebody in PwC that worked in our UK firm, John Major was the guy in the building that was at the door. John Major was the doorman of the building that we had. What John Major did every day is welcome everybody, whoever it was, into the doors of PwC. And he did it with a smile. This particular story talks about what John Major, the individual, does each and every day. A client shows up, takes a red eye from the stage to our London office to hear a pitch for a piece of work. John Major meets him at the door. The individual says, hey, I'm a couple hours early. Is there a place I can take a shower, maybe get something to eat? John Major says, of course, let me escort you. We have a gym in the building, there's some showers there. I'll get you some towels. Escorts the individual into the showers while the guy is showering. John Major goes off and finds the guy some breakfast, brings him some coffee, leaves it there for this guy. Guy comes out, surprised by the hospitality, has a great breakfast, has a chance to recuperate, heads upstairs to the conference room by which we're going to pitch him on a piece of work. Our people walk into that conference room. There's John Major, there's the individual sitting there. John Major is long gone, and he's back at the front desk in the beginning of the building, greeting everybody else like he does each and every day. The team walks in. He says, hey, I got a question before we start. Does John Major work for you guys? We say, yes, John's the door guy. Everybody knows him. The individual stops and says, you don't need to pitch for the work. Because if John Major represents the culture and the values of your organization, You've already won the work without pitching. And in fact, what I'm going to do over the next hour, rather than hear your pitch, is I'm going to call the rest of the competitors and say I'm not coming. That pitch was for about a $2 million piece of work. It was for a client that eventually ended up to be a tens of million dollar type of client. John Major did something very sim simple, very easy to do. He smiled. He said thank you. He went the extra step. He brought a degree of humility and humanity to the interaction that he had with somebody he never knew. John Major is somebody we actually have brought out of retirement when we have major conferences that we host around the world to be the person to coordinate what we're doing and to greet guests of PwC. Every year we go to the World Economic Forum in Davos. Some of you might have heard about this organization where you bring 3,000 people together. Well, for the last five years when John has been retired, we bring John back because he's so good at what he does for the little thing that I just described. If you want to be successful in a career path or arguably successful in life, smile a little more, say thank you a little more, go the extra step a little more, and demonstrate the humanity that you want to receive when you're traveling around the world or traveling across the street. Do unto others as you want to do unto yourself. And at the end of the day, 
that's going to give you a leg up no matter what you choose to do professionally or personally. And in today's day and age, because of some of the trends we are seeing, those kind of human traits are going to be even more important as you think about your personal life and your professional life. It's going to be important to you as much as the organizations you join. And let me describe what those current trends are that cause me the concern to focus on the humanitarian side of the equation and not the technical side of the equation. So a couple of years ago, we at PwC spent time thinking about what are the major trends impacting countries, companies, individuals around the world. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those and the degree of implications that come from those. And then bring it back to what does it mean in terms of the kind of people organizations more broadly are looking for and how people should think about the skill sets they need to have to be successful. So first, let's talk about these trends. We landed on five trends. Now, what's a mega trend? A trend is something that is factual, proven by data. A mega trend is a trend that is actually having a huge impact on society overall, and it is existing today. I talked about these three years ago, the last time I was here. Let me regroup on those so everybody understands what I'm talking about. The middle one is probably the most important, demographic shifts. The amount of people that are growing, living, working, learning, retiring in various countries is going to change the world we live in. It's clear that when you look at not just the demographics out of a China, but also the demographics out of an Indonesia, or in India, or in Malaysia, those will have implications to the world order that we are currently living in, and those implications are happening today. <coughs> and they have affected, therefore, other trends, which I'll talk about in a second. The other aspect of the demographic shifts is the fact that the middle income people, not defined by US standard as to what middle income is, but a global standard, is rising significantly, giving a class of people significant influence in terms of consumer purchasing power, working power, as well as needs. And that's going to drive how governments and corporates react to that. That's going to drive where people make investments. And as you travel around the world and interact with various countries, that's why there are many more countries on the high level of investment list as you look ahead. If I've got shifting demographics, I actually have to have a place where they're going to live and work. And that's the concept of increasing urbanization. Over the next 10 to 20 years, 70% of the world's population is actually going to move from rural areas into urban areas, thereby requiring a huge amount of infrastructure, new cities to be built. And we're not talking about cities that are the size of New York or London. We're talking about size of cities that are two to three times that of which governments are going to have to spend a amount of time and energy building the infrastructure to make it happen and make it worthy of people wanting to live there, work there, and travel there. And that's going to be important in terms of the amount of money needed to build those, but it's also going to have a counter effect. And there's areas in the US, there's areas in the UK, there's areas in Germany that are actually seeing the opposite effect, which is as you have more urbanization, you will have areas of countries that are less attractive and corporates moving. And as a result, you end up in a scenario that is for the haves and the have-nots, which is one of those societal issues that is extremely important. The third thing that has to happen as a result of the demographic shifts is shifting economic power. In the US, we have been blessed with having a significant amount of economic power over the last 100 plus years. And because demographics have shifted, the balance of power in terms of who had the most is clearly shifted. The amount of companies that used to list on US exchanges or want to be listed in the states has decreased significantly. First, because many companies are going public or private, away from a public company status. But second, places in Shanghai, places in Malaysia, Indonesia have capital, exchanges and the like that allow for corporates and entities and policies and procedures to be set in areas other than a New York-centric economic power. And that's important to understand because the way people think is definitely different from around the world. The 
The other trends that are on the table is the issue of scarcity of resources. As you look forward over the next decade, the world is going to need 50% more water. It will need 40% more energy. It will need 35% more food. In a world where, in fact, scarcity of resources is becoming a problem. And let's talk scarcity of resources in two other ways. Money, do I have enough to build all that infrastructure? Human capital, do I have the right amount of people to fund societal programs? And do I have the right people to actually be fit for the needs going forward? Of which you end up in an interesting phenomenon where people will be fighting over resources more so than ever before. And I'll come back to the implications of that in a second. And the last piece of the mega trends is obviously technology. It took us a number of years to get to the number of devices equaling the number of people in the world. We actually hit that mark in about 2006. Primarily after developed countries, actually people in those countries had multiple devices. What's happening today is on average, there's about seven devices for every one person in the world. Countries like Africa are going to leapfrog ahead because they're not going to rely on infrastructure. They're going to do activities on mobile devices, which will be an interesting implication to then what happens to workforce, what happens to consumption, what happens to work and leisure and healthcare and financial systems. Today in India, as an example, 98.7% of India and its population, no matter where it may be, is connected. That's actually better than the US. That's actually better than many developed worlds, which is enabling India to actually transact more on an internet basis and leapfrog ahead of many individual developed countries. These trends are real. These trends are here today. These trends have tremendous impact. And when we looked at these trends four or five years ago, we got the trends right. We actually underestimated how quickly they would have an impact. And we underestimated the amount or the enormity of the impact. So let's talk about secondary effects. We use this acronym ADAPT. So let's talk about each one of the pieces. Forget the acronym. The first one is asymmetry. What do I mean by that? The haves and the have nots came a lot faster than we thought. Did you know, did you know that there are eight people in the world, eight people in the world that have more wealth than 3.5 billion people combined together. Eight people, more wealth than 3.5 billion people around the world. Think about the implications for that for a second in terms of the amount of responsibility on the eight, or perhaps the obligation of the eight relevant to the world order that we're now living in. And has, in fact, and you hear it in the media, you hear it in the politicians, has what's happened over the last couple of years as a result of those trends served society well. Huge implications, which I'll come back to in a second. The second thing that's happened is this thing called disruption. We talk about disruption quite a bit. Disruption of businesses have meant that businesses are merging together, sectors are merging together. A pharmaceutical, a pharmaceutical company is now, in fact, a technology company, a retail consumer company, an auto company. I was just with some of the auto, man, auto manufacturing companies over the last couple of days. How much tech, as they think about autonomous vehicles and the like, is built into that business? How much financial services is thought about it? How much healthcare is thought about in automotive, where in fact, if you're driving, there's companies that are trying to think about, can I actually measure your biometrics to tell you when, while you're driving, you need to head to the hospital because of XYZ condition that the car is detected? The blending of these sectors is unbelievable in terms of thinking about how I compete going forward. Now let's talk about disruption in a different way. China is an interesting country when you think about what it did. Over the last 10 or 20 years, they built cities, cities that brought masses of people together, and all of you have some device similar to this one, where the manufacturing was done in that particular city. If you go north of Shanghai and west of Shanghai, there were cities built to bring hundreds of thousands of people to be in the manufacturing plant as a low cost environment to build this out. That created the employment and the economic growth in China. If I'm going to bring robotics into the manufacturing, I've got a lot of people potentially unemployed in China. 
as a result of the trend that's going to accelerate in a really fast-paced basis. That kind of disruption is big, both in terms of how to react to it, but also the social implications of that. And the Chinese government today is very, very focused on how do I manage the risks of a society that might potentially leapfrog faster than some of the developed countries of what, in fact, are the issues that may come in terms of societal support and job creation to support the economics that are in that country. The third one you see on the list is age. Those demographic trends that I talked about is shifting dramatically. The average age in Japan, believe it or not, is about the average age of Germany at 46.1 years. Huge implications in terms of health care costs, retirement costs, social responsibility in terms of pension obligations and the like. And how do you fund them in a country where that average age is not going to change much over the next couple of years and there's not a group of large people coming in? Talk about Africa. The majority of the African countries, the average age is 18. 18 where life expectancy now in those countries is increasing significantly. So not only will they have a longer career path, there's going to be a longer opportunity to think about some of the issues of how do they find employment, how do they fund the social welfare programs necessary to make it happen, and then what happens when, in fact, that large group of people ends up in retirement. These are the kind of conceptual issues that cause all kinds of disruptions in the eyes of politicians, government officials, royal families, and the like. Populism. Over the last couple of years, globalization has helped quite a bit. Connecting the world, taking people out of poverty, and the like. But two things have happened. The world has not been served well over the last couple of years. You do have more of the have and the have not because of the issues I described. And as a result, you've got people having a natural human reaction, which is to look inward and long for the world they used to have. The second thing that happened is because of technology, there was more awareness of the potential aspirational world to be part of. And historically, you didn't have that kind of insight. Today, you do. And the question is, why am I not having that opportunity for success? As a result, you've got a fraction of people's motivations of their view of the opportunities and whether they can be part of that uplifting experience that social and economic benefit. And if not, the populism, the nationalism, becomes very insularly focused in terms of, I got to protect my own. And as a politician in those countries where there's an election, you are interested in satisfying 2% of the population. The 2% will take you from 49% to 51%. And that's all you want to be elected, which is not necessarily great in terms of, do we have the right people in leadership? actually trying to serve the masses as opposed to get elected by a 2% swing vote. And that's an issue around the world as we think about the traditional systems that we've had. Which leaves you with the less issue on the table, which is around trust. In a fast-paced world, the world's moving very fast. People need time to assimilate what's happening. And if, in fact, you don't over-communicate both what's happening and why, as a human, you assume the worst and lose trust. The second thing that's happened over the last couple of years, last couple of decades arguably, is that when people look back historically, we did have a group of people that perhaps were in that 1%. Maybe not equivalent to the eight that have the wealth that they do today. But those people, arguably, had access to information, were in leadership positions, and did something about it. They did something about it in terms of serving the masses. The economic crisis over the last decade or so has pointed to the fact that the group of people that are on the inside, that have access to information, maybe used it inappropriately, maybe didn't serve the masses well as a result of it, and therefore I have lost even more trust in those in leadership positions. And oh, by the way, when I grew up, I thought with hard work, with good education, I could become one of those people. And the reality is maybe it's not so easy anymore. Maybe it's not so possible anymore. So as a result, trust is continuing to evaporate. A, because of things moving fast and us not understanding the implications and the what and the why, but also 
this group of people over here that actually might have inside information that might be doing something, and I'm assuming the work, and they're not serving the mass as well. And that has got a huge implication in terms of trust in society. Government to business, governments to taxpayers and citizens, business to taxpayers and citizens, NGOs, media. The amount of trust is being fractured because of these conversations and those two major implications. And that's a world that either we have to redefine how to re-engage to get trust or figure out a way to operate the system in a much different way. One that is not necessarily vested on just GDP growth. It's got to bring economics as well as social responsibility into the mix. And over the next decade, there's a high likelihood that we've got to do a heck of a lot more redefining capital markets at large in terms of how they not necessarily serve just the bottom line, but that how do they continue to be very inclusive and serving the mass as well. And going back to the basic principles of the past has to be applied in the new world order that we're living in today. Folks, I would tell you that these mega trends are real, they are big, they are impactful, and while many organizations think they're coming, they're here today and you gotta react. The second thing is how do we actually get our leadership teams and our leaders more of an understanding of what's happening and why and then what they need to do about it. Which comes back to then, how do we actually frame the kind of conversations that we want to have? Let's talk about some facts for a second. I mentioned earlier the concepts of globalization versus nationalism. As reported by the press, globalization hasn't served society well. Well, these are stats from a CEO survey, of which we have similar stats from individuals from around the world. You can see some of the stats on the page in terms of how people believe the concepts of globalization, i.e. a more interconnected world, have served well, and in some cases not served well. Looked at a couple of the percentages, universal connectivity, it's great that in fact we've got a heck of a lot more connectivity around the world to actually transfer knowledge across geographic borders. It actually has helped tremendously small enterprises tap into an ecosystem that's not based upon just local activity. You are connecting small businesses to a larger group of clients globally by leveraging the internet. You are actually allowing for trade to happen across the basis. You are actually trading and leveraging a supply chain that's much more global in nature to create economic opportunity. And yes, you have created and enhanced the lower middle class to some extent. But like I said earlier, more people see the opportunity, less people believe they've gotten it. And so the gap is wide, and even though the relative number has actually increased. The negatives on this is the perception that globalization, capitalism, as it's described today, is not fit for purpose anymore. And this is where I would say the politics and the media, and this is not just a US issue, this is around the world, is focused too much on bilateral or multilateral trade agreements, and not enough around disruption of jobs, disruption of work, from a technology and a productivity perspective. And in fact, if you look at some studies, job losses as they exist today, probably eight, ten, eight out of 10 are probably more due to automation, robotics, and things like that than they are trade agreements, even though there was an element of displacement because of trade agreements, or wage arbitration because another country could do the same kind of work for less dollars, therefore improving the bottom line. Nonetheless, the point on this page is organizations, no matter how big and small, Countries, no, how, no matter how big and small, have to be thinking about how they connect their work, their people, their flows of capital markets in terms of investment to the rest of the world. Why? Because the demographic shifts, the urbanization shifts, those trends I talked about, are not going to be able to be seen as an opportunity without thinking more broadly than just their country or their company. And second, there's an interdependency on all of them being tied well together. Let's talk about the implications for a second. What does this mean for the future of work? On the page, again, you see some information in terms of concerns and or opportunities. The two concerns, 37% are worried about automation in terms of the implications of job displacement. Up, but not up that much compared to the past. And if history, using the historical perspectives and facts rather than what I'll call the perceptions, we have gone through these cycles before. What is likely to happen is not the displacement of work or jobs, but rather the displacement of processes within somebody's job. 
And that's important to understand as you think about you joining the workforce going forward. Because in fact, what automation is going to do is change an element of what people do today. It will also create job opportunities tomorrow. But it is not likely at the pace everybody assumes or is what is portrayed uh, externally going to happen in the next five to 10 years. What's going to happen is 10% of your work may be technology enabled. But it's still going to require you to do some things differently but bringing technology into the workforce and into your job each and every day. Which I'll come back to then what kind of skills do you need to be successful. Second, the data point on there are 73% of the people saying a robot or the artificial intelligence will never replace a human. I'm going to argue that's overinflated. There is too much advancement when you think about the combination of technology, robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, that in fact is able to detect cancer at a rate better than a doctor, is able to solve a problem faster than a human. And it's only a matter of time before the combination of all those things together will end up creating some form of technology that will be better equipped than the human brain. It's not happening tomorrow. And the question is going to be for us, when do we think it happens? And what are the social and economic implications associated with that? And that's got some really interesting philosophical approaches. And you guys have heard this. If I'm driving a, an auto, a, autonomous vehicle, Who's coding whether the car crashes to the left or right? And where's the lesser damage and who's making that choice? That's no different than choices that humans have to make today. You had the floods in Houston because of the hurricane. Somebody had to make the choice to release water in the levee off of the dam that actually had an impact on one city versus another city. It's just a question of what's the data necessary to make that decision and who's actually coding it now to make that decision in a non-human factor. The other good stuff that's on this page, 74% of the people really ready and willing to relearn. The point here, very specifically, is that education never stops. Learning never stops. And in fact, what corporates need to do once you join the workforce is continue the education you've gotten in schools like this. Today, many of the US and arguably some other countries around the world have put a lot more time and energy into the investment of learning curriculums on the job, either through on-the-job training, classroom training, self-training. And that's going to be the new world order because the pace of change cannot stop. The level of learning cannot stop. The level of evolution can never stop. Because I will tell you, as you think about you joining the workforce over the next couple of years, whatever you're planning for in terms of the skill sets you need today, it's going to be a different skill set at a technical level tomorrow. Some of the core philosophical approaches or core skill sets that are softer may be the same, but the technical aspects will definitely be different. And that gets into the next piece. What does the world of the future look like from a business perspective? On the board, what you see is a framework. On the axis going north to south, more fragmentation, more silos. Down on the bottom, a more collective point of view, a more interdependent point of view, a more interconnected point of view. On going east to west, how do I think about individual? How do I think about the collective? A couple of pictures that are painted on this world. Possibilities are there. On the top one on the left hand side, business becomes very focused on societal responsibilities. Appropriate business ethical and social responsibilities being worked together. On the lower right hand side, corporate is king, you're into individual bottom line enhancement, shareholder value, not stakeholder value. Those are two widely different mindsets for an enterprise that can be applied to a corporate as much as it can be applied to a government. And there's all kinds of permutations in between. The point I'm making when you look at this kind of framework is that there's probably not one answer to the question. It's not a binary. It's probably a combination of all the above. There's organizations today that fit in one bucket or the other bucket. What's interesting is actually how are they rewarded, both in terms of the consumers that buy their products, the employees that join their organization, the shareholder investment that they are willing to make. And it is very much moving more towards a stakeholder analysis, not just a shareholder analysis. There's a lot of room for improvement in that regard, 
what we're seeing as a trend as we look at our organizations is that stakeholder analysis is becoming more important, which is probably less unique to the US. The US is still more in the shareholder value because of the way the capital markets is actually created right now. Now, if you're living in that kind of world, what kind of skill sets do you need? What you see on the page, it might be hard to read, is some indications in terms of what the skill sets are that we need going forward. Top of the list, problem solving, adaptability, collaboration. These are the soft skills that become ever so more important because the world is changing so fast, I can't tell you with a linear explanation what your job is gonna be today and what your job will be three years from now. I don't wanna even predict what businesses PwC is gonna be in more than five years from now because the world is gonna disrupt us, we will disrupt ourselves. Instead, what we're looking for is people coming off the campus that have demonstrated they can collaborate, they can think big picture, they can apply the learning at a local level to execute in a much different way with a degree of innovation. And in order to do that, it's all about leadership skills, communication skills, collaboration skills, and oh, by the way, the corporates will give you the technical responsibilities, the technical acumen, the business acumen that you'll need to be successful. You've got to demonstrate agility, adaptability, and resiliency. The organizations that will be successful going forward will learn to scale up and scale down very fast. I no longer want to be in this business because the world has changed dramatically. I no longer want to be in that geographical footprint because the world has changed because of politics, regulation, or otherwise. I definitely want to be in this new business. How can I get there as quickly as I possibly can? That's how the world will happen from a corporate perspective in terms of agility and resiliency. Survival of the fittest against the environment that they are operating with. And the question is going to be, do they have the right people and skill sets to adopt very quickly? Which is why, in fact, these softer skills become ever so more important. If I'm sitting where you are today, the question is, how do I demonstrate that in an interview? Because it ain't going to come across in a resume. And that's where the storytelling becomes extremely important as you think about your personal brands. And that's where demonstrating you've done it in the past between a job that you've had previously, a club that you are a part of, a leadership on a project that you took on, in demonstrating what you did to lead, what you did to convene others, what you did to go outside of your comfort zone and still be successful is going to be important to your interview process regardless if you're looking for a teaching job, an engineering job, or a job at PwC from a business perspective. This applies to every single sector in every single country around the world. And that's where it's going to be important to think about how do I actually gain those experiences and those skill sets and then be able to tell the story to somebody across the table that's willing to make the investment in you in terms of the job offer that may be coming and make the investment in you to put forth their personal capital to give you the opportunity to be successful while you're working in their organization and working with them. When we stepped back and looked at this challenge, we, PwC, and there's many different frameworks to think about, thought about how our people have to fi have five basic skill sets. Do I have the right business acumen? And within that, the right digital and technology acumen to be relevant for the future? Do I have the right technical aspects? And do I understand the fundamentals of my job in a technical enough way that I am an expert and will be sought after? Do I have the right global acumen? Doing business in the States is a heck of a lot different than doing business in Saudi Arabia or in China. And oh, by the way, regardless of what kind of trade agreements we have in the world, we will be doing business with those countries. You will be sitting across people from those countries. You will need to understand how they think, how they act, no matter what level you come in on. You need to actually be thinking about, are you good at relationship management? If you want to be a leader, you need to think about all the stakeholders. If you want to think about all the stakeholders, you need to know who they are. And can I actually understand and communicate with them to understand what they need and why they need it, and what I can do for them, or in some cases, maybe not do for them? And can you communicate that effectively to keep those many stakeholders happy? 
That stakeholder could be your boss tomorrow. It could be your client that you're serving in PwC. It could be the future recruit that you want to bring in. It could be a competitor. It could be a politician. It could be an academic. It could be a teacher. It could be a regulator. It could be a district attorney. During your career path, you will deal with all of the above. And how you actually manage the choices of what somebody wants versus what somebody else wants, and how you play middle man or middle woman is going to be extremely important. Relationship management is a fundamental issue to demonstrate leadership. Leadership is all about how do you convene people together to get them to achieve something totally impossible or they themselves thought they weren't capable of achieving, individually or as a team. The only way to do that is actually understand what their skills and capabilities are. The only way to do that is to have relationships that are trust-based in terms of what you do. And the last skill, which is at the center of everything, is whole leadership. How do you think about yourself as a future leader? How do you demonstrate that you're a leader today without the title? And how, in fact, can you convene people together where one day you're in a leadership role, tomorrow you're in a following role, and you're following another leader? And how can you demonstrate that you are an expert in something that people will seek out and want your expertise in some way, shape, or form? Or want you to be on their team because you've served well? Or want you? to be invested in by them if you're an entrepreneur doing your own thing. You've got to be able in 50 seconds these days to convince somebody you're the right person for the job or you're the right person for the particular task at hand. First impressions are huge. John Major's first impression was huge in terms of that client. John Major, because of that story and many others, was the reason he was sought after. John Major ended up serving in PwC well beyond his retirement years and we bring them back on a part-time basis because the brand of PwC is so important that we want the best to be the face of PwC. That's why he's at these conferences. And oh, by the way, John Majors had a blast doing it, right? I mean, he's met some unbelievable people. When we've had him in Davos, he's met with you know, U2, and they come in and use our conference room. He's met presidents. He's met entertainers as the guy that's the doorman of PwC because of the little things he did. And those little things go a really long way in terms of demonstrating these kind of skill sets going forward. Now let me come back to where I started, which is what does it take to be successful? What does it take to get the job? What does it take to be successful in the job no matter what it may be, no matter where it may take you? Two other stories here, folks. One is you got to do your job well, whatever that initial job is. The only way you get a relationship with people that want to invest in you and bring you into other opportunities is by doing quality work. That is fundamental, foundational. Then there's the question of what are you doing above and beyond the specific task at hand that says you'll go above and beyond to A, become better yourself, and B, help other people become better. That's at the workplace as much as it is in the communities you work in. Because this concept of environment, stakeholders, is not just the people on your job to the left or right. It's actually equally as important to be serving the community that you're part of. How do you make people better? How do you make corporates better? How do you make communities better? How do you make countries better? Leadership is equally important around the people and the jobs and the corporates as it is about how do you help a country be better in a world of where, in fact, countries are competing with one another in a global economy that I described earlier. So doing a quality job, but then going the extra step to learn yourself and enhance your personal brand, and then give that learning to others for them to be successful, I would say is the second step. And the third step is take some risks and get outside your comfort zone. The world we are living in is not linear. You are not going to come in and say, I'm here today. I plan to be there tomorrow. It is going to zigzag left and right because of the job being changed, because of your personal life being affected, because of what you think is important today might be totally different from what's important tomorrow, and you're gonna make different choices. I can tell you from my own personal experience, I left this, this university, this school, thinking I'm gonna join PwC, stay two years, get a CPA, and get the hell out. And here I still am 30 something years later in the exact same organization. 
but there was no way that I ever expect that when I came to PwC leaving SUNY Oswego that I would have interviewed presidents, went to the Oscars multiple times, traveled around the world, sat down with family members of royal families, and sat down to give business advice to people that candidly I looked up to for many, many years. The world of possibilities was great because that zigzagging helped tremendously. And the one thing I would say as you think about plotting your career is don't plot too far too fast. Think about the task at hand, do it really well, you do it really well, you go above and beyond, you take some risks, you'll get sought after. You get sought after, someone will step up and be your advocate, they'll be your sponsor. They'll create the opportunities for you and they will give you more choices to say what you want to do. And therefore you have more control in terms of what choices you want to make and what path you want to go on. Because your job should not be, when you get that first job offer, what's next? Your job should be, I come in, I do a quality job, I go above and beyond, and therefore I've got seven different opportunities. And two years from then, you can take your choice of which one of the seven makes sense because you're two years more mature, your family situation has changed dramatically, and your path of thinking has changed dramatically. And that's the world that I think you're gonna be living in as you look forward to this world of mega trends where the world is changing extremely fast. And the question for the individuals is how do I actually sustain myself, show my relevancy, and actually demonstrate that I, individually, am bringing a personal brand and a personal value that somebody else wants. And with that, folks, I'm gonna pause. I've thrown a lot of different concepts at a very high level for you. I, as I said when I started, will answer everything and everything. We've got until six o'clock, we've got about 35, 40 minutes to get into Q&A. Take advantage of the time, don't be shy with it. Let's have some fun with the Q&A and see where it goes from here. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. <laughs> so if I remember correctly, here's the way we're gonna do this, we've got Q&A with the possibility in the audiences. We've got microphones on the side. Just raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. We do have people in the overflow room. We'll get questions from them. We also are um, webcasting this out live. We've got potential questions that are coming from the audience. Every so often, I'm gonna go to my left here and ask for a few questions that are coming, to the extent they are. Who the heck knows if anybody's out there? And the reality is I wanna make sure we have the chance to hit what's most important to you guys, which is top of mind. So with that, who wants to start? I know the hardest one is always the first one. Um, thank you for speaking, and uh, I want to give you a question. So before you do that, yes. the way I've done today, you gotta tell me your name, tell me where you're from, and tell me the best vacation you've ever been on. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Jae Won Kang. Um, I'm an international student from South Korea, and I'm, I'm uh, now I'm studying US CPA, and I took the CPA exam in August, and I'm planning to uh, be work in the governmental enterprise in my country, and so I want to how the world become uh, different. So I came in the US, and uh, I took this speech for this reason. Um, so what is the last? Vacation, best vacation. Um, before I come to SUNY Oswego, uh, I visited California um, two weeks, and I visited Santa Monica and Malibu and some other beaches, and I think the best beach I uh, visit is, you know, Venice Beach. Yeah, Venice Beach is kind of a place uh, the crazy people can join. <laughs> so I think it's good. You probably say that about a lot of America that you see sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so, the question is, um, you say the adaptability is very important in this work, and so what do, how do you think, what is the best way to improve one's ability about adaptability? So great, great question. Um, as you think about proving adaptability or agility, the job is actually to say, what have I done um, as a student, as I grew up, in taking on different projects that were probably not necessarily attuned to or directly responsible for the areas I'm familiar with. 
something outside and different. So what we'd like to hear from a recruiting perspective is you've done a really good job in X. Um, you're part of XYZ kind of program. You traveled the world and you had some experiences. Um, you moved from place to place. You took on a totally new and different project that Canley wasn't part of your core skill set or the training that you got at school or even in you know, grammar school in, in, in Korea or otherwise. So demonstrating those kind of abilities to move from place to place or do things that are different than outside the natural linear approach is the best way to actually demonstrate that kind of skill set. And that's where during the interview process, talking about what you've done on the resume in terms of how you actually took on different responsibilities that tested your skill set is important to tell that story during the interview. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Others? Uh, we're going from Twitter. Uh -oh. It's Kevin Sun. I don't know where his favorite vacation was, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but that's a really good question. I don't understand, but you will. Um, on disruption in ADAPT, would daring industry lines create new intersectional businesses and new professions? So let's give some context to this. When I talked about disruption, um, two or three things are happening. Um, Technology and humans are spending a tremendous amount of time rethinking both products and offerings, but also how to eliminate excess capacity. Uber is a great example of that. Airbnb is a great example of that. The second thing that's happening is those sectors I talked about are blurring together. Third thing that's happening is supply chains, where you get your raw materials from, and the time it took to take supply to consumer or consumption is shortening. A real life example today, um, years ago, an automotive company probably had to spend a lot of time right now to find out how can I actually get enough supplies to replenish the autos from Puerto Rico because of the hurricane that just happened. Today, I have a better sense with data analytics that I can actually manage better the supply chain to the consumption that's going to be needed post the hurricane effect. So those three trends, absolutely yes, will create new opportunities. So now let's talk about new opportunities. You will end up in a scenario where data becomes very important and trust over that data becomes very important. And I'm going to take it back to PwC. We're known as this accounting firm that provided trust over a set of financial statements I'm probably in the future providing trust over data. The healthcare system is a great example of that. Today's healthcare system in the States and many countries around the world has data that a doctor takes that is different than the data that the pharmaceutical company has, that's different than the data that the government and the insurance company has as you think about a medical problem. The new product, the new offering, the new service is who actually can create the data warehouse that everybody can subscribe to. So this way, they've taken the cost out of reconciling all that data. A new product, a new service will come from that. The second thing that's happening is not only are you changing the products and the services, you're changing the entire system. What do I mean by that? Systems that we have today in terms of why do we file XYZ compliance reports, or why do I need to use a bank to do this because of regulation, there's money and people that are spending a tremendous amount of time saying, I can change that system that was based upon a bunch of premises that are old, they're dated, and the bureaucracy created them, and my job is to disrupt them radically. That is creating a tremendous amount of opportunity for new employment, new skill sets, new products and offerings that I think will be the continued transformation of organizations. And you see it already today. Why did Tesla become as big as it became so far? When in fact the automotive companies that thought about electronic vehicles actually thought about it a while back. And oh, by the way, Tesla is more focused on actually how do you bring battery power to the table, not necessarily just the battery power necessary to fuel the electronic vehicles. Why did Elon Musk just volunteer to go to Puerto Rico to say, if you're going to rebuild Puerto Rico, think about battery power and solar power in a much different way. Forget the cars, folks. 
change the entire system. And that's what's happening when you've got people that have the time and the money to think radically about the products, the offering, and the system that you're on today. And I think that gives tremendous opportunity for job creation, job growth, and additional disruption and entrepreneurship as you look ahead. Let me do others from the audience here. Again, guys, don't be shy. We'll take personal, professional, and or otherwise. Back corner. Hi, I'm from the overflow room, so we've got that check. <laughs> Uh, my name is Brian Abad. I'm a finance and economics major, double major, and uh, my best vacation, to kick that off, is um, my mother's from Ecuador, so we took a month and we uh, ran around all of Ecuador with, you know, family guides, and uh, it's really the best way when you do it like that, and uh, being on an inactive volcano that was once like a potentially overflowing volcano in the uh, city of Quito, and being on a horseback and like trying over that volcano, looking over the city, was pretty, that's my best vacation. Weren't you nervous walking around a volcano? Um, not as much as I am now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's fa fairly good temperament. <laughs> so um, my question is: so we we're talking about a lot of we're talking a lot about disruption in the uh, future of the economy and how uncertain uh, innovation like AIs and automation is going to be for just like simple jobs like the trucking industry, for example, which holds. Um, I believe, I, I could be wrong, but about like 5% of the uh, GDP job market. But, so how do you see the, so we can reach a point where unemployment reaches 5% and not because of the unskilled um, amount of the population not able to find work, it could just be structural. So how do you see the allocation of resources um, across the population? And then the question which I want to pose to you is how do we get those 15% to find a purpose to actually contribute in some way when everything has already kind of been taken care of? So it's a great question, and I think that's one that a lot of people are debating right now. But let's go back to a couple of things you think about the trucking industry. Um, today, society at large um, is worried about the amount of unemployment that's going to come from autonomous vehicles relevant to trucking. Um, and they see it as a new technology, one that hasn't been necessarily implemented in a big time way. If you were to talk to the mining companies around the world and the agribusinesses around the world, they have already made that change. There are autonomous vehicles actually doing the mining, doing the farming, and in fact, both of those industries have done two things. They've actually found opportunities to retrain their people to actually do what is necessary to actually now manage the trucking fleet, either by managing the monitoring center or writing the code necessary to make it happen, or doing the R&D necessary to actually make it come to life and the testing that's going to be required of that as they go through it. And they've actually then repopulated the world in other ways. So the benefits of the R&D from the autonomous vehicles, they've actually then plowed into, how can I think about that kind of technology in a couple of different ways? So a lot of people won't know is that the mining industry, or at least a couple of the companies, has taken that technology, which is actually the, a massive amount of data, and sensors and apply that to then manufacturing. And now you've got more people employed in the manufacturing space because they've actually created a new business that's more on the manufacturing side than it is on the mining side. And leveraging sensors because they learned how to use sensors in autonomous trucks, it's created actually growth and potential. So there's an opportunity there to reframe the problem. And again, we want to make sure that we're thinking about both sides, not necessarily the negative side, but also the positive side. The thing that is most important in this is are the countries and are the leaders providing a vision for what that future world looks like? And are they actually creating the policies, procedures, and infrastructure to skill the workforce for the future? So that's going to be really important. When, when we travel around, we give our clients lots of advice. We also give countries advice. And the advice we give to countries is first, Think about how do you accelerate your domestic agenda and the domestic growth so people want to invest. The way you do that is to have thriving businesses, a thriving metropolis that people want to live in, or a thriving metropolis where people want to visit for tourism. The second thing to do is actually get more certainty into your systems. Because give me a better sense in terms of what's needed on taxation, regulation, compliance, laws and rules and things of that nature. The third is you better make sure your country's workforce is fit for purpose. 
And that's where you actually have to bring government and business together, say, how are we going to solve for that problem? And unfortunately, this is the challenge that I would say the UK had with Brexit, the US had here, in terms of have we skilled or reskilled people to be ready for that future? Because too many people lost jobs because the manufacturing went away. Too many people lost jobs where, in fact, the amount of people at the toll booth are no longer needed, or at the deli counter because you're automatically using an iPad to put in the restaurant order. And that's the kind of challenge that we have as a country or countries have as an organization to say, are we skilling for the future? And that requires leaders to then paint that future vision and then put the infrastructure in not only higher education, like here, but even in your grade schools, your vocational schools, and things of that nature. And that's where I think we got to go at that. If you're not able to do that, that social unrest that I talked about, the worry that China has sitting here today is, man, I got to make sure a billion two worth of people at least are fed every day, taken care of every day. And what's the right way to do that? Well, the way I'm doing it today is building out these big mega cities, doing a lot of manufacturing. But in the next 10 and 20 years, if all that goes to robotics and AI, I've got a huge social problem. I've got a huge trust problem. And it's not the current president's issue, it's the next president's issue in China. All right, so as he develops the next five-year plan, which will come out next week, he's got to be thinking about what foundational changes I make today to be ready for tomorrow. And that's where I think country leaders are trying to do that. Saudi Arabia is another one. So let me just bring that to life for you. The, the, the king of Saudi Arabia and the crown prince right now that just brought into that position, they put a thesis that said we are way too dependent right, on, on gas and oil from a fossil fuel perspective. How should we diversify? What's going on? Well, what? going back to those megatrends, let me talk a second what happened. When the price of oil went down as low as it did, I'm not sure if any of you would have remembered this, what happened in Saudi Arabia, there wasn't enough cash flow to the country. As a result, they basically put both their military and their corporate enterprises, the state-owned enterprises, on furlough. Oh, by the way, there was not enough money in the system to drill the wells for water. Going back to that issue around resources, holy heck, if I got no water in the country, I can't drill the wells, I got a huge societal problem. I've got the risk of civil unrest. So hence the reason they had to quickly, and they should have done this a while ago, think about how am I really going to diversify you know, what I'm doing in Saudi Arabia. Now what's interesting in Saudi Arabia, if you think about it, and it's the rest of the Middle East, it's not necessarily just what's happening in the Middle East in terms of its dependency on oil. What's the asset it has today as a country? Well, what's interesting in the Middle East, one of the assets is it's a transient location to allow for people to travel there and then go to Africa over the next 100 years and to go to the rest of Asia. So how do I actually make that a hub for the world? And in fact, if that's what I want to do, I've got to think about tourism now. I've got to think about some of the soft arts right now. I've got to think about cultural stuff, entertainment, et cetera. And that's where that Crown Prince is trying to think about how do I actually put that infrastructure in place to be both focused on gas and oil today, but tomorrow it's more the transient center of the world kind of conversation, and that's a huge asset for them. And that's the kind of stuff that deals with then your 15%, the labor or the loss of labor or the loss of skill sets that are in there. Long-winded answer to your question, I apologize, but just bringing to life what's going on. All right, help? Go ahead. Good afternoon, my name is Karen Martin, and uh, recently I studied before and learned that PwC has the highest level per employee. So my question is, I'm very curious about how PwC achieved this organization uh, efficiency. So before I answer my question, you need to answer mine. <laughs> okay. Vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I actually am the uh, wife of one of the faculty at Oswego. I'm taking, uh, I'm taking the uh, UNC math program and study before. I didn't actually hear about your question about vacation. Can you repeat What's again? What's the best vacation you've ever had? Uh, I think uh, uh, one of the best vacation I've been is uh, uh, in 2011 when I was in Egypt. And when the whole North Africa has the uh, ref uh, whole government re reform, and I was there, and there are three days we don't have any uh, telecom services, 
And that's the moment I realized, wow, this technology and how human beings cannot live right now without technology and all this communication system. So that sounds great from a vacation perspective. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so if I can, let's go back to the question she asked. Um, PwC today, we're about 250,000 people around the world. We operate in 150 countries. We're roughly speaking $37.5 billion of revenue. Um, when you look at the publicly available information, because we're actually not a public company, the revenue per person is actually a little bit higher than the competitive landscape that we have. All right? Why is that? I would say it's probably two or three things. Um, we probably have a higher proportionate amount of our revenue coming from very large global organizations, as opposed to other organizations that have a market share in what I'll call small to medium sized organizations, which requires a lot more teams and a lot more friction that comes from it. The second thing is actually how do you leverage technology in a different way to deliver the services? So PwC, while historically been very focused on the human capital, the other thing we're doing is investing in a lot of digital technologies, methodologies, tools, techniques. Um, you will hear this from a lot of places. The kind of things that we are doing is probably leading edge, which we've never thought about doing even in the past three years. So I used this example earlier today. We bought a drone company. Why in the heck would PwC want to invest in a drone company? Well, the reason you invest in a drone company is a drone, drone is another way to gather data. It's a piece of technology to gather data. If we're doing a project around supply chain or infrastructure or planning of a next major city, that drone is helpful rather than a human going out and actually surveying the land that you got to do. Oh, by the way, if you can do that, maybe the drone should do the inventory count for the next audit rather than the human doing that. Now, am I replacing the human? The answer is no. What I'm doing is replacing a task that can be digitized, and I'm going to ask the human to do more analysis because I don't need as much time and energy on something that can be done from a technology perspective. So that's the second piece of the pie. The third piece of the pie is actually making sure that we remind ourselves that I've got to continually invest in the future. Organizations need to be effective and efficient, not for the bottom line, but actually us in particular, it's a partnership. Are we investing in our own people? That's our biggest asset. So the amount of money we're dumping back into training, for example, training on those skill sets I talked about, training on the technical acumen that I talked about, training on how do you enhance the digital IQ of our people, that's the reinvestment because we need the bottom line contribution to reinvest to be sustainable as we think about both the skill sets needed but also the new businesses that we want to be part of as we look ahead. Okay? All right. We have, we have a Twitter from Kate Hanna, who you might know. Um, Bob, you mentioned a lot of different experiences in your career. What has been the coolest and what's been the most unexpected? <laughs> Um, I shared this one at lunch. I'll share it here. Um, you probably all know the brand of PwC for the most part. Um, some of you might know it as this accounting, auditing, consulting firm, business firm, et cetera. Some of you might say, oh, those are the group of people that do the Oscar counts. Some of you might say, well, that was the group that screwed it up this past year, <laughs> um, et cetera. Um, but the two probably coolest and most interesting experiences I had we're probably going to the White House to give Michelle Obama four years ago the envelope for the best picture announcement. Um, it was cool because it was in a part of the White House that I'd never been in before, even though I'd been to the White House once or twice before. Second was meeting her. Um, third was just to see what was happening behind stage in terms of what goes on at the White House. And that was just tremendously interesting to see how logistics work and the like. So that to me was unbelievable. I'd say the, the other ones that come to mind is the ability to interview presidents of our country. Um, I've had a chance to interview um, Clinton and Bush. Um, Obama was still in office by the time I left my US role. And to have a chance to hear from them what they thought they did well and not so well, um, what they saw as the biggest challenges, how to deal with them, how to bring them down to a human level not put them on a perch as this you know, unbelievable uh, role and role model for us to follow no matter what your political affiliations are was super cool in terms of understanding you know, their career path, 
how they got to where they got to, and then the kind of decisions they had to make. And you know, you're dealing with life and death situations on this stuff, of which we're behind the scenes on a lot of stuff. If you open up the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, just about every article, we're probably behind the scenes. And that goes to not only corporate events, but even country events um, in terms of what we're doing. So today we do stuff with government agencies. We are helping some of the defense agencies. We're, you know, today we do something where we're trying to help actually reduce the number of suicides coming out of our military. It's that kind of stuff that we're part of. So to hear it from them is a pretty interesting and unbelievable experience that I never, ever would have thought about when I graduated and walked out of here in 1985. That's for darn sure, especially for the kid that said, I'll do this for two years, get certified, and get the heck out. So others in the audience here. Go ahead. We got two. Oh, go you oh. first. Hi. So uh, my name is Kevin Sun. This is a follow-up to the question that I was asking on Twitter before. Oh, uh, favorite vacation, I guess. Yeah, now we do get to hear the answer. Yeah. To um, I guess maybe six or seven years ago, my family went on a trip to Taiwan. It was like uh, our native country before my family uh, immigrated over. So it was just nice to go back home. Um, so my mom used to work as a pharmacist in a hospital before it got bought out. And I was thinking about like the blurred industry lines you're talking about and how like hospitals and hotels are basically sort of like molding together recently. And um, basically, like, hospitals are becoming more commodified and just, like, acting like hotels. And, like, I was just wondering if you thought that there might be some new lucrative business opportunities in that uh, sort of field. Because, uh, well, people are really concerned with, like, bedside care in, in hospitals. And it's kind of silly that hotels treat people better than hospitals do sometimes. I would agree with your philosophy there, but go ahead. <laughs> and uh, the second part would be, do you think that healthcare can be automated? Like, do people, will people even have to go to, to medical school in the future if we can just have, like, vaccines and surgery machines and all of that? Will robots just be our doctors for us? So uh, in response to the first question, I think the answer is yes. Any government any corporate, any government agency, any hospital, or uh, in your case, hotel, has got to be thinking about more so customer at the center of everything that gets done. And people will want to, and probably ultimately will choose for the customer experience, which is the combination of a better quality outcome and a better experience to get to that outcome. And what you see organizations doing today, particularly in the healthcare space, is how do I create a much different experience from the start to finish? And that's important. That example I used before in terms of a utility for the data, what people will argue is that by the time I get to the hospital, that, that person is asking me exactly the same questions that I got asked 14 times ago. Or I've gotten three different people come in and ask me the same question. Now, let's go back to the root cause. Why do they do that? Well, they know that when people are in a trauma situation, they will give certain information. And in fact, they're so traumatized, they actually have to go back multiple times to reconfirm that information. But in fact, if you're able to capture that data differently at the start, you have a better opportunity to actually go talk about it on the fringes as opposed to talk about and recreate the wheel on everything. So I do think there is an opportunity now, and you see this probably in countries outside of the US that think much more so around a a healthcare system that is digital in nature, easy to have access to, great quality, and great customer experience. What's interesting is, um, believe it or not, India is actually setting forth a foundation to go there in leveraging technology, which comes now to your second question. India basically put a system in place that said, give me your retina scan. You can open up a bank and a health account no matter who you are around the world. And because I've got 98.7% connectivity, I'll leverage the internet to allow for that to happen faster than ever before. And it's taking Alibaba and Alipay concepts in China to a new extreme. But they're laying the foundation for that first. Their challenge now is then how do they get the right 
health care quality and health care customer experience into that system, but they've now leveled a great platform. So new services, absolutely yes, as you look ahead. To your second question, I don't think you're going to eliminate anytime soon the need for humanity in the healthcare system. I do think you will leverage technology to help bring an efficiency to the healthcare system to allow for more humanity. I mentioned Japan earlier in terms of the average age at around 47 and change. Japan doesn't have enough healthcare workers to actually provide the basic healthcare needs today. They are spending time with robotics to think about how do I create the, the robot that's the nurse that can take care of some basic, maybe not advanced issues, but some basic issues. So as I think about scaling issues for healthcare, you know, sort of simple stuff that can be taken care of automatically through technology and self-service, stuff that can be health relevant to robotics, but other stuff that needs more of the bedside manner and the human touch, I'm gonna bring the combination of those two things together. I do think there is the potential that people will do research on that. I don't think it's going to happen very soon, but I do think it'll actually start to blur together and that tail end where robotics and humanity will be there. And the challenge is going to be how do I bring humanity into the robotics? That's the big question that I think a lot of AI companies, technology companies are trying to think about. The more you think about technology, the more you have to think about the human aspect. A, baking human thinking into the technology, and then second, as you use technology, the implications for adoption of it, use of it, and the ramifications of it. And that's actually where organizations today that are doing well in that space are bringing that customer experience, that user experience, into AI, robotics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and that's actually gonna be a sweet spot, and I think a competitive advantage for them going forward. Go for it. Hi, my name is Miranda. My uh, favorite place that I went on vacation was I went to uh, Munich, Germany during uh, a German soccer game, and there's nothing like seeing a whole bunch of Germans screaming about their team just kicking Brazil's butt. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question to you is how would you describe the PwC uh, corporate culture? How does that translate multinationally, and um, what do you think makes your company one of the best companies to work for? So I'll go to the first part of your question. I don't, I'm not sure I would use the word corporate culture. And the reason I say that is we're a, a partnership and a series of partnerships around the world. And, and some professional services organizations are partnerships in private companies where other service companies are public companies. As a result of that, it allows us to take a longer term view and a balanced view versus, again, operating in the US where you always got to focus on the next quarter's earnings. That causes you to think and allows you to, to think differently. And let me give you an example. When the financial crisis happened, typically every service organization would have said, okay, the economy is going to change. They're not going to need as many people. I'll lay people off and I'll reduce my headcount. And in the past, all of us, PwC included, spent time doing that. This last cycle, it allowed us, because of a strong balance sheet, to take a totally different view, which is go long people. Because the short-term aspect of the corrective cycle eventually will turn it, which then everybody's going to want more people, and we want to have them. So actually, let's go long on the people side. And I don't have to worry about the earnings and the outside investors, because the partners are the investors. That creates a different long-term sustainability mindset. The second difference around culture is one of entrepreneurship. Um, in a global world, the model we have allows for very local tailoring, not a one-size-fits-all. And that's important because the way we do business in India is much different than the way you go to business in Germany. The product you offer in Chile is much different than the product offering that's needed in New Zealand. So you gotta allow for local innovation. And local customization, if you call it that, has actually gotta happen closest to the client and closest to the people, rather than corporate structure dictating from the center what that world's got to look like and with policies and procedures and stuff like that. The differentiation in terms of a blessed place to work, I think, is making sure that we continue our focus on people's well-being. The average age of our place is 26 and a half on a worldwide basis. It allows us to think about 
more aspects of our job is not only to serve our clients well, our job is actually to make you as an individual more successful. And if I have that vested interest now with a different stakeholder, not just on the bottom line, but your personal brand, and oh, by the way, your personal brand joining PwC when added together with 249,000 other people is the brand of PwC, those interests are very much aligned. So if I have the vested interest in you, both for how you develop, your success, your well-being, your ability to manage work and life personally, that's a great opportunity for you to be successful and hopefully a place to be. When we've done the analysis, you all coming out of university, and I'm going to generalize here, want multiple experiences. You want technology that's equipped to what you have today in your personal life but in a corporate environment. You want to be able to give back to society and do stuff outside of the workplace. You want to have maximum flexibility to work any place, any time. And you want to be part of something that's bigger than perhaps just the bottom line and understanding the strategy and being part of that strategy. The more we communicate, the better off we are on that in terms of the role you can play. The more we can equip you to be successful in that world, the more happy you're on, the longer you possibly stay. And even if you leave, you're now the best advertising agency for the organization. So having a people first kind of model helps us actually then define what policies, procedures, and the like you put in place. And hopefully, therefore, you get the reputation and become the talent magnet. And that's what it's allowed us, I think, and I'm generalizing, but I know, you know there's plenty of competition out there. That's the kind of stuff that we have to deal with. The past I've had to deal with, as I think about our people, competing with Wall Street for the most part. Um, in the past, we went for finance people, and people would say, what's more important, a finance major or an accounting major? And we compete against the high compensation of Wall Street versus maybe a lower compensation but different experiences. Today, I'm competing more with the tech companies than I am with the Wall Street companies because I'm trying to create a really innovative digital world, and I've got to create that same kind of concepts and environment for people to thrive, work any place, any time, be innovative, be creative, be successful, team in a way that's very collaborative and probably more open in terms of what you do today. That's the kind of stuff that defines our future because that is the future we're living in based upon these trends I just talked about. Yeah. One last question from Twitter. This comes from Ben Aparicio. It's a, another good question. When talking about retrainability, what skills do you believe would benefit to work on in your free time? Um, <coughs> I would, in your free time, become more well-rounded, um, learning things that are outside of your purview of expertise that allows you to walk into any situation to be able to at least start a conversation um, and develop relationships with lots of other people. Um, one of the leaders in our Korean firm, his, he requires his leadership team to actually read books totally outside of the profession so they are better rounded individuals coming back to business acumen and global acumen because he knows we will provide the technical acumen in the organization. And if I go back to what's going to be important in terms of agility, learning some things that allow you to move from point A to point B or point C is going to be important of which you need some knowledge around that to understand the world you're operating in. And what's important as we think about being in that fluid, adoptive world, two things come to mind. One is that digital aspect, and second is that human or societal aspect. And the more you understand not what's happening in the world, but why it's happening in the world, I think the better off you're going to be. And if you can learn about that, observe that, be a, a recipient of the learning as you travel around the world and be a sponge for knowledge in that space, I think it not only equips you for whatever job may be appropriate for the future, but actually whatever environment you may be in in the future. And that's going to be important because these megatrends are going to disrupt not only corporates and academics, but also the communities by which we're operating in. Others? All set. All set. Anybody else here in the audience? Because I'm, go ahead, we've got, go ahead. Got a microphone here? Uh, thank you once again for coming and speaking to us. I'm Eli Van Norman. I'm a senior marketing major here. Uh, best vacation, hands down, would have to be spring break last year to Cancun, Mexico. 
I don't want to hear anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question that I have for you is, was there a decision that you've made throughout your career where you made it heavily based on, uh, from an ethical standpoint or based on your moral compass? Yeah. Um, I've made decisions with an ethical responsibility and I've made mistakes with a moral responsibility. Let me describe what I mean. Um, one of the hardest things in the world to do is to, as a leader, make sure that the behavior of other people is appropriate, not from a legal perspective, but in the eyes of others from a moral perspective. And at what point in time do you look at behavior and then make a choice that might be just inappropriate for the values of an organization versus the interpretation of law? And there's been times in my career where that has really been biased on the ethical and moral responsibility to make the right decision irrespective of the various points of view that are out there. And I can think of two or three times where I ultimately was the decision maker and it was the lesser of two evils, but you made that choice, maybe to fire somebody or maybe to get out of a business that actually had a negative bottom line effect, but probably the right risk effect for the brand of the organization because your responsibility is to protect the brand. And that becomes really interesting in terms of doing what's right, not necessarily for you as an individual, but doing what's right as an entity and a leader of that entity. Um, all of us, at least those that are in the business school, the accounting schools, you've heard around, you've heard around the demise of Anderson. Anderson, WorldCom, Enron drove a lot of that, but it was actually probably more so around, you know, did the leadership team do the right thing at the right point in time in the environment that we're in? And it's likely that I, PwC is not going to fail, but I'm either getting fired, resigning, or going to jail myself before that happens. And there were some tremendous learnings in that time frame. I would tell you when um, Anderson went down, we, we as a PwC organization chose not to go try to acquire a lot of their businesses. We were worried about some of the liabilities that might come. But we sat down in front of a lot of people that we wanted to hire. And there were tears in their eyes because of everything that went wrong and them losing everything. Um, there were situations that uh, we became aware of in terms of what they knew versus we knew, and knew, we at times knew more than them. And it really pointed to then, you know, what's your obligation as a leader to make the right decision, not for you, but for the masses? And what's the right decision for the brand? And that's more to the ethics and the moral than it is the legal. So that's one element of your question. Second element of your question is um, enabling people's success and giving them a chance to succeed. It's always a judgment call. Um, I know I have put people in positions, new roles and responsibilities um, at times where I've stretched them. And in secondary thoughts, I probably didn't give them enough support to make them successful or I didn't enable the people around them to be successful and they failed. Shame on me. Um, there's been other times where you stretch somebody and you learn that lesson and you did give them the mechanism to be successful and they've thrived and it's great to see that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of lessons learned in what I'll call the, the decision making process of what's most important. We at PwC today in a world where trust is important have to make those kind of decisions all the time. What clients to take on and what not to take on. What projects to take on and not take on. When to go public when there's a problem or not. During the financial crisis, when we were issuing audit opinions, what we started having calls every Saturday morning to say, in the financial crisis, let's be really clear when we call something out that we don't cause an additional crisis. Because maybe our determination where we see a problem may not be right, but if we say it's wrong, the whole world's going to assume it's wrong. It's going to go bankrupt really quick. So those are the judgment calls that we make each and every day, which is a combination of the technical and the legal, and then the judgment, and this is to deal with the ethical and the moral. 
Um, and that's been really interesting and a great learning experience. But the question becomes now, well, how do I teach others to do the same? Because in that world I described, that's going to become more important. The moral and the ethical is a hell of a lot more important in the eyes of multiple stakeholders than ever before. And probably what's going to happen is the world's going to judge organizations, it's going to judge people by how they've not followed the rules but done stuff in lieu of the rules or lack of rules or the right things regardless of the rules. And I think that's where the integrity and the moral and the ethical become really, really important. Others? We're over time, so I'm going to say one more and then I'll try to wrap it up. Unless I'm happy to keep going, guys, but go ahead. I've got a microphone in the middle needed. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, my name is Brandon. <laughs> um, I'm an accounting major with a minor in economics. Uh, my favorite vacation would probably be when I went to Jamaica in middle school. And my question for you is, what dorms did you live in when you were here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a um, little bit of history and I'll end on this note. Um, when I came to the school, I first um, was a product where I was one of four kids, oldest, first one in my extended family to go to college. I had grades that were okay, and I was definitely an introvert. I looked at various SUNY schools, um, chose this one, because when I walked in front of the Hewitt Union at the time, which was the main center of campus, people smiled. People were generally more happy here from what I saw in terms of the interaction. It became a gut decision in terms of where I thought I would go. And I will tell you, I honestly thought about it. I give my father the entire credit of this. I was going to put off school. Right? I, I, I worked in various jobs, you know, various, and just to, to give you a sense, I worked at a women's clothing store in the stock room. All right? I thought I was making decent money with that job, so much so that I said to my father, Dad, I'm not sure I want to go to college. Maybe I'll put it off for a year. I'll continue to work in the women's clothing store. And my father sat me down over a breakfast in the diner that says, son, you're going to school. So thanks, Dad. Um, <laughs> I chose this school. I came up here. I ended up in my first two years in Cayuga. My second year, I worked at the desk to help pay for and offset some of the cost. Because again, wasn't a, a wealthy family by any stretch of the imagination. My third and fourth year, I stayed on campus. I was in Scales Hall as the RA. Um, great, great learning experiences in terms of how to interact with people, what to do and not to do, when to deal with the rules and the regulations versus the ethical and the moral. Um, a chance to create an unbelievable social network um, and make some friends that were there for a lifetime. I did extremely well in class for the first two years. <laughs> My friend from those years was in the audience and just laughed at me. <laughs> I became part of a group of people that leveraged the social opportunities tremendously <laughs> in my last two years while able to maintain some level of good grades, but the more important learning was everything else, including the time in the dorms and the like. I left here having a job opportunity to intern at IBM or join PwC. My father worked at IBM and actually had a chance for me to intern there, which I did, and they gave me a job offer. Um, when I did the interviews, I did the interview at, at PwC in January, and they gave me a job offer that day. I told them I wanted to wait until I did the interview process at IBM, which was not until a little while later, literally a month and a half later. I got both job offers. Now remember, I took accounting, for anybody that's read some of my bios, because I thought this was a great opportunity because A, I was decent in math, and second, because I heard partners made 90,000 bucks a year. <laughs> so it was all about the money. At the time I got the two job offers, IBM was going to pay me 21,000. PwC was going to pay me 18,5. I went on spring break and made the decision on spring break talked about spring break. Trust me, that degree of influence on what I was doing probably influenced my thinking at that point in time as well. I chose to go to PwC 
because I thought it would be easier to go from PwC to IBM as opposed to go to IBM to go to PwC. I definitely moved my thinking away from the money to more options. And that was the thought process. I had the time of my life here on this campus because of not just what was happening in the classroom, which was you know, good and foundational, but was the human interaction for the people I met, the people I learned from, the people I had experiences with, and that served me well on a lifetime basis. My best vacation was when I had the opportunity, and I'm blessed, to give back to my friends, my family. I take my family away every year. We do a vacation on the beach, we rent a house. The extended family is now 20 something. We rent a six bedroom place in New Jersey on the beach. There's kids sleeping on the floor. There's uh, kids from two years old to 24 years old. My brothers and sisters come, that's their vacation. Um, I enabled a vacation four years ago with a group of people from high school and from college, some who have never met each other before. And I had fun with it because I actually came up with the idea of not telling them anything until the night before they left. The only thing I asked for was give me a weekend. I asked 25 people, 25 people said yes, here's the weekend. I gave them three rules, don't ask anybody else whether you're going, don't ask many, me any questions in terms of what we're doing, and last but not least, dress for warm. Think about that thought piece for a second. Am I dressing for warm to go skiing or am I dressing for warm because I'm gonna be on the beach? Nobody could figure it out. <laughs> what was great was going away the night before to check out the place we're going to to make sure it was all set for these 25 people. What was even better was how many of them didn't know who else was going and people from this university who hadn't seen each other in 15 years were meeting at the airport not knowing they were going to something that I was hosting. We had the time of our lives over four days. We had a blast. I am fortunate because I had the opportunity to do that. Many of the people that went, some unemployed, some hadn't done a vacation for 10 years, but an opportunity to give back and enable was the best vacation other than my honeymoon. <laughs> Hi, dear. <laughs> but that was a great opportunity to you know, continue the network of the learning that went on and the network of people I'm still friends with. And some of them <clears throat> I know are watching. Um, life's too short, okay? Life is absolutely too short. You gotta have some fun in this world. The friends, family that you are sitting next to today or spending time with at home, make sure that you step back and say thank you to them for what they've done to enable you. Take care of them to the extent you can and you're privileged to do so and make sure you invest in the center of that circle around relationships. Many people in my circle of friends will say I'm an enabler because I spent the time to invest in the relationships. When I graduated, the reason those friends are still friends, I set up phone calls to stay in touch with them twice a year for every year after we graduated college. And that circle of friends has served me well, not from a work perspective, but to demonstrate that outside of work, Wow, work is worthwhile because it's enabled me to live, but work is not life. And as you guys leave this place, take advantage of the opportunities that you're given. I will jokingly wrap up that yes, Professor Stanley, President Stanley was in fact my legal professor. I did walk away with a C in that class, by the way. <laughs> but nonetheless, here I am still standing in front of you trying to talk about my experiences. You all have a hell of a lot better upside potential than I did, based upon the experiences you have, the school you're a part of, and the learnings you've had prior to me coming here to talk to you today. Take advantage of those, the world's your oyster, the choices are yours, you will make that world more friendly. You will make that world more successful. You, if you choose to do so, will lead in that world. And it's not as negative as, you know, unfortunately we are all making it out to be right now, because it's full of potential, full of opportunities, but it's on your shoulders as you walk out the doors. Guys, thanks very much. Appreciate the time there.